Welcome to another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. I'm here at the News Forum where all voices matter. Well, recently our guests co-founded the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. They declare they are fighting for a more democratic economy. Today we'll dive into what that means. So joining us are co-founders Robin Shaban, Keldon Bester, and Andrew Cameron. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for having Thank us. Robin, uh, start with you. Uh, welcome back to the program. Um, this is going to be an out of left field question for you. I know you can handle it. First of all, why is this project needed? Are monopolies all that bad? Well, the reason why this project is needed is because with the upcoming review of the Competition Act, we need to ensure that there are voices at the table that are representing the needs of consumers, of workers, and interests beyond just big business. Um, the Competition Act, which is our core competition legislation, is really core for managing monopolies and market power more broadly in our economy. And um, we need to have these laws in place in order to address market power and the impact of monopolies so that we can have a fair and equitable economy. Uh, Andrew, I'll go to you. Uh, obviously, the name of the, the project is the Anti-Monopoly Project. So clearly, there's, uh, uh, I guess, a, a baked-in conclusion that too much monopoly is a bad idea? Is that, is that where you're coming from? Yes, that's fair, because when everything gets concentrated quite that level, it doesn't leave room for small businesses and small towns and people who aren't part of those big conglomerates to, one, hear, have their voices heard or even have economic opportunities, right? So I come from a small town in a smaller part of the country that is being left behind as businesses consolidate into larger centers in the bigger cities. A lot of the economic opportunity moves away from, like I said, my, the, well, in my case, the Maritimes, right. from our part of the region. Uh, Keldon, uh, want to weigh in on this as well? Why, why are you involved in this anti-monopoly project? Well, I think, you know, as Robin hinted at, we have a balance right now, especially I think in the think tank space where the voices of concentrated economic power are, are most often heard um, and that the voices of consumers, small businesses and smaller communities are uh, are pushed to the side. And, you know, to the question of, you know, why are monopolies so bad? I think it really comes down to, you know, at what level do we have any sort of control over our economy? And, and that's why we have that, that word democratic in there. And so what CAMP hopes to do is to be a, a balance and to provide a different perspective than, than you usually hear from the economic or legal community. Yeah, Robin, let's dig deeper into uh, Keldon's last point there. So uh, you're clearly thinking that there's a, a space in the dialogue that happens kind of on the intellectual level or the think tank level that is not uh, really being expressed. So you want to kind of occupy that space. Is that fair? Yeah, um, I mean, historically, when you look at our modern competition legislation, which was enacted in the mid uh, 1980s, um, from then up until now, the policy scene, the group of experts that's been really key at driving competition law reform forward have been, um, I would say, um, tied to or related to um, the large corporate interests that are engaging with the law. So oftentimes experts in Canada, they're the lawyers that are representing businesses, either complaining to the bureau, the competition bureau, or um, representing firms that are being investigated by the competition bureau. We don't have a um, community of expertise uh, quite yet that um, represents diverse perspectives and diverse needs as part of the dialogue. Although we've been well on our way in developing this community. And, and that's one of the projects that we've actually recently uh, initiated at camp. Uh, explain a bit further on that point. What, what have you just initiated? So we have a project that we're um, undertaking right now. It's a monthly meetup where 
uh, policy thinkers, um, policy experts, and other researchers that are interested in the issues of monopoly and competition, but um, don't really know how it fits into their work or why it's relevant to broader economic questions can come together and we can discuss some of these meteor um, economic policy problems. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, uh, here at the News Forum. We're here with Robin Shaban and Keldon Bester and Andrew Cameron discussing a new uh, organization called the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. Uh, Andrew, go to you next for this next question. Uh, is Canada doing more poorly on sort of tackling these issues than other, say, OECD countries when it comes to monopoly control and... Uh, and uh, consideration of policies that uh, are on the right track versus the wrong track? So it's a hard question to really identify or not. I think one of the thinking we had in Canada, you know, really sort of started in the 70s and the 80s was we have a feeling that our sort of national economy isn't big enough. And we had to, that we felt that we had to let our largest companies combine and become large to generate enough size, enough scale to be able to keep to keep pace and to compete internationally. So I think to some extent, you could argue we let more monopolization and more consolidation happen in the hope or in the pursuit that we could compete more internationally and in, improve our economy that way. My, my take on that, though, is it left, you know, a lot of individual Canadians in smaller towns behind. So it's hard to know great are we doing better or worse but we've we've chosen a policy that's led us to this point and i think we can choose a different path forward that'll make things better or like we say more equitable more fair for all canadians uh keldon i've noticed and i'm sure you've noticed too that uh whenever there's a proposal for a a large uh, multi-billion dollar merger in canada uh in whatever field it could be telecoms we obviously we know about the roger shaw debate that's happening but in other fields as well, the the argument they trot out is, yeah, it's going to be bigger, but uh, we'll get uh, economies of scale that Canadian companies need to compete, and uh, we'll be able to invest in technology or or uh, equipment or whatever, and that can't happen unless we're bigger. Is that is that the kind of argument that you're you're facing, and uh, are there counter arguments to that? Absolutely, uh, economy of scale and, and more broadly what we call efficiencies arguments are a big part of mergers uh, such as Roger Shaw. Um, you know, the question is what uh, incentives do our laws create? You know, if there are economies to be gained, why doesn't it make sense for a company to reach those economies of scale through investment, hiring more people, building out more capacity, as opposed to removing capacity, removing jobs, from the economy, things that we now call efficiencies. So we're not about to pretend that economies of scale don't exist, although I think it's a, it's a concept that has been uh, used and abused um, in recent years, but we wanna think about what kind of rules do we wanna set up to get the kind of economic growth that we want? Do we want um, companies investing and uh, you know, building out their capacity or do we want them doing what is certainly the easier thing and the quicker thing uh, by buying up their rivals and, and reducing competitive intensity. Uh, Robin, I could see in terms of the goals of your organization, uh, I mean, there's uh, public policy, you, you mentioned the review of the Competition Act, uh, but there's also these d discrete case by case uh, where these uh, monopolies are being assembled, uh, let's say, or oligopolies at the very least, uh, so are, are, are you picking a lane there or are you trying to influence all of that? Yeah, we'd like to participate in that sort of work as well. And I think that there's a real opportunity for more support for smaller or medium sized uh, organizations that want to be engaging in cases, whether that's submitting complaints to the Competition Bureau or um, perhaps even intervening in cases. Um, but there's a lack of technical knowledge 
that is accessible to these organizations. Again, a lot of the expertise in competition law is caged up on Bay Street with uh, you know high priced and often inaccessible lawyers and economic experts. So we have um, the, the group of us have provided some guidance um, to some organizations as they seek to provide complaints to the Competition Bureau. So we have been dabbling in this work and uh, I hope that um, as a next stage beyond the review of the Competition Act and our participation in that, we can provide some more targeted support to other organizations that want to be participating in this because there is a real need. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion. Obviously, uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll be back after these messages, so please stay with us. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. Uh, we're here with Robin Chaban, Kelvin Bester, Andrew Cameron from the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. Uh, Kelvin, uh, love to get your uh, your sense of the reaction you've received. Robin was talking about your uh, engagement with uh, with people that are interested in uh, sort of taking on the uh, some of these uh, monopoly uh, uh, or or merger. Uh, applications, but what other reactions are you getting out there? Well, I think the reactions can be organized into two uh, groups. You know, one, the establishment uh, competition policy space, and the other, the small business or associations and organizations, as well as civil society groups that that we interact with. And and with the with the second group, we we have a lot of encouragement and and people who are already engaged in adjacent work that are excited to hear about this. And, and we look forward to working with those groups. Um, but for the establishment community, there was a, a period and, and, and Robin in particular, as, as well as our colleague, Bas Bednar experienced a lot of this was that initially a lot of uh, trying to dismiss these arguments um, as uh, hipster antitrust or, or whatever sort of nickname they want to give it. But, but increasingly, folks are, are having to actually engage with the substance uh, of these arguments. And I think a, a flashpoint of that was the uh, Rogers Shaw outage, uh, where I think Canadians uh, really faced up to some of the consequences of our monopolized economy. And, and we saw a, a, a real uh, swell in support and attention uh, on that topic in particular. Yeah, that's very interesting. I actually was going to ask you about that. Uh, obviously, that, that's that been top of mind with Canadians uh, since that uh, that day uh, and night and perhaps into the next morning, uh, <laughs> if I recall correctly. Uh, Andrew, uh, you know, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that, that particular case study. Sure. Uh, what sort of lessons learned uh, are you hearing about or are you advancing on that one? And I'll give the same question to Robin as well. Sure. I think one of the biggest things is to remind ourselves that if we create these quote unquote efficient systems is they also inherently are very fragile and very weak. Like I said to somebody once the saying is don't put your eggs all in one basket. We don't tell people to do that. And so I think for, and I think for a lot of small businesses who are fighting to try to stay alive over the last couple of years of COVID and deal with all the issues there to wake up one day because this efficient telecom system broke and they wake up one day and they can't take debit. Like nobody knew the Interact system was reliant on the Rogers network, but that could be quote unquote efficient, but it is very fragile without any backup systems or redundancy which is part of what happens is, is that's where a lot of the savings come from when companies merge is, oh, we can get rid of this redundancy or we can get rid of these things. And then we create these weak, fragile systems that we all rely on. Uh, Robin, uh, your point of view, uh, what were you thinking when the outage was happening and what, what lessons were learned immediately after that? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to build on a lot of what Andrew was saying that um, I think it highlights this uh, characteristic of monopoly, which is fragility, right? And the need for resiliency, which are concepts that 
when we talk about economic policy, we really haven't talked much about, it comes up a lot with climate, right? But when we're talking about our economy and what do we want from our economy and our markets in order to meet our needs as citizens in Canada, resiliency is becoming more and more important. And I think it, to me, it really highlighted the importance of the work we're trying to pursue here, which is economic policy that is driven towards a purpose, right? Purpose being creating an economy that is fair and accessible and market power feeds into that in so many different ways and monopoly does as well. And again, also this theme of resiliency. It's about thinking about what we want from the economy and creating that rather than letting economics and economic policy happen to us. Yeah, I used to call it, uh, when I was in government, the Department of Redundancy Department, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we yeah. would kind of make fun of it, but you know, there are, are reasons why you want redundancy in the system, right, Robin? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, especially as climate becomes more unpredictable, um, that idea of resiliency is gonna be so key for our collective economic welfare. We're gonna continue our discussion. We have another segment left, don't go away. We'll be back with Robin Chaban, Keldon Bester, and Andrew Cav uh, Cameron, who are co-founders of the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with representatives of the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project. Uh, uh, Andrew, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, I'd love to get all of your reactions to this, but obviously uh, I'm not belittling in any way the work you're doing, but the focus of people right now seems to be on inflation, uh, cost of living. Love to get your senses, perhaps all of you, on where you think camp can fit into that public policy discussion because that's kind of driving the political discussion now and basically what's on the minds of, of 38 million Canadians. Andrew, you want to take a shot at that first? Sure. I'll start. And then uh, Robin and Keldon wrote a, a paper about how monopolies have impacted the inflation rate. Right. So I'll pass it off to them very quickly. But I think it's to talk about, you know, the role that market power can play in pricing. Right. That in a, you know, in a situation where people are expecting inflation, if you have market power, you are able to take that sentiment that prices are rising and increase your prices higher than your costs are going. And if you have market power, consumers and people don't have any other options or any other choices other than to pay the increased price. So part of what we want to talk about in that inflation discussion is talk about the role that, um, you know, firms with market power, or even like the fragile shipping uh, industry, the excess costs it's been to ship goods and the supply chain issues that have come from consolidation and efficient supply chains, how they play into sort of the inflation issue that we've been having. Um, but if Robin or Keldon have anything else from the paper, I'll pass it off to you. Absolutely. Uh, Robin, do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. So like Andrew said, Keldon and I wrote a, a piece not too long ago about the connection between competition law and inflation and how competition law, increased competition and an awareness of monopolies and their power can actually help us address inflation and get outside of the monetary policy box, because that's really the main tool for inflation. But if we focus on addressing in particular exploitative conduct of businesses where businesses raise prices just because they can to the detriment of consumers, we can perhaps tackle inflation more directly without having to uh, deal with, uh, I think, more mm, double-edged sword sort of policy like monetary policy. Uh, Keldon, do uh, you want to jump in on this too? Uh, you were co-writer of the paper. Yeah, what I would just add is, you know, there are a number of factors uh, outside of competition, you know, commodity prices being being a big one that are, that are driving inflation. But the competition angle, I think, is really tied to the ability of 
uh, firms to pass on costs of consumers. And, and that's ultimately a power question. Uh, there was a Globe and Mail article that said, well, grocery stores have actually been able to just keep their margins the same as before. Um, so that doesn't seem like a uh, sort of corporate greed issue. And I don't really agree with the corporate greed framing, but a situation where a company can pass on all of its cost increase to consumers and maintain the same profit margin on a, on a bigger share or sorry, on a larger number um, is, is, is problematic to me. And I think that is you know, something that says we know who is in the driver's seat here uh, and it's, it's not consumers. Uh, Andrew, how, how is your organization that you co-founded reaching out? What, uh, what methods are you using to get to stakeholders, to government uh, policymakers, et cetera? Well, right now we're just at the beginning of launching. So we hosted a uh, sort of a launch webinar last week with the three of us. And we had uh, Barry Lynn from the Open Markets Institute come up and speak and Stacey Mitchell from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. So we had people at that one. We're still, you know, reaching out through our networks and through people that we know and other organizations that we're in. Because I think one of the things we've identified is a lot of people don't know how competition law affects them on a right. day-to-day life. So a lot of it is explaining the problem and then talking with people and people going, oh, I didn't even know this was an issue. Right. So we're still a lot on that phase of just, okay, this is a problem and this is how it impacts you. Well, uh, we're, we're out of time, so we'll have to have you back when uh, you've uh, got a lot of work product. I'm sure you're going to have that, but thank you for joining us today. Thanks so Thanks. much thank for having much. us. Thank you. Interesting discussion there with the Canadian Anti-Monopoly Project representatives. A lot of interesting work they're going to do that'll help us hopefully uh, tackle inflation and cost of living as well as the important issues of corporate concentration. Thanks for watching today.